Hello, aloha, and welcome to History 241, session 16 that deals with Chinese philosophy from 551 BC to 221 BC. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Khan. Uh, I teach here at Newell Community College. Uh, just to remind you, please uh, go to WebCT and check out uh, any schedule, you know, assigned assignments or any uh, readings that you might have to do or any problem that you confront, please let me know and call me at the phone number and the, or email me at the address that you would have on the WebCT schedule uh, or syllabus. So please check that uh, constantly and let me know if you have any problem. Uh, contact me and I will try my best to, you know, get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, so today we will be talking about in session 16 about the uh, Chinese philosophies, as I said, from about 500, uh, 551 BC to 221 BC. Just to uh, give you the, my uh, website, I mean uh, the uh, email address. Here it is. Uh, please uh, note down that uh, email address. Uh, very simple, K H A N A. Uh, you just add uh, A to my last name, Hana at Hawaii.edu. And you can call me, as I said, anytime you want to, but please uh, use the latest uh, phone number uh, that uh, I have for you on, uh, in my uh, uh, syllabus. And again, when you uh, contact me, especially through the email address or when, uh, on the phone, uh, please let me know uh, in the subject slot that you are from my History 241 uh, Asian Civilizations class so that I would not uh, you know, confuse you with other students that I might have. Uh, during the same session or during the same semester. So uh, let's uh, move on and see what we did last time. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the uh, rise of the Zhao dynasty in uh, western China and uh, I mean the west, uh, western Wei Valley and then in the northeast plains of China. And how the Zhou dynasty to bring them in power, how they use the mandate of heaven as in sort of a political instrument or justification and you know how they wiped out the Shang dynasty and brought themselves into power. So here this mandate of heaven that was previously under the Shang dynasty sort of uh, religious theory now became a political theory uh, under the Zhou dynasty. And from here onward from the Zhou onward it would stay much more as a political philosophy as well as a religious philosophy. We also talked about uh, the material development under the Zhou dynasty, how agriculture, commerce, trade and business, you know, and different uh, products uh, got out of uh, China or the Chinese developed and how this uh, very agrarian culture was soon turning into as a, a commercial culture. And also we talked about uh, the uh, end of the Western Zhou dynasty and the rise of the uh, Eastern Zhou dynasty and that as I said you know because of the barbarians when they invaded the Western Zhou, the Western Zhou people or the Zhou dynasty they had to move their capital from west to east and that's how this was a major event in the breaking of the dynasty into west and east. We also talked about the religious and the social developments in China and how from now onward that is from uh, the Zhou dynasty onward uh, how you know society would work out and how the religion would be perceived because it was during the Zhou dynasty as you remember I said that uh, religion crystallized it became much more clear what people meant and it was much more religion at that time a uh, sort of a field for the ruling classes, for the emperor, you know, and it was not meant for the common people at that time. It was not really personal with every person. It was a communal or sort of a group activity that these group of the people, uh, the, the groups of people had to be led by their local rulers, by their local leaders into, you know, the worship of one or another god or into praying for whatever they wanted. So it was sort of a communal and group activity rather than an individual activity. So that's how, you know, the Shang used it. Not that any religion would stay the same for always. It does 
change with the passage of time, with the passage, you know, with the difference of the place. So, but, but at that time, at least in the Zhou dynasty, it was much more communal and left to the rulers, religion, left to the rulers and not to the people themselves as individual, you know, uh, practice of that religion. Let's see today what we have in session 16, which uh, deals with, as I said, you know, with the uh, Chinese philosophies. So we would talk about the birth of Chinese philosophies, uh, at least three major philosophies. Uh, the circumstances that led to the rise of these Chinese philosophies during the warring state period, uh, which was, uh, you know, in the Eastern Zhou dynasty period, the warring state period. And keep in mind the, how these philosophies were, you know, to begin with, these were not just philosophies of crazy people, but these were philosophies, the thinking or the mindset or thoughts of great men uh, who came up with these solutions, you know, and because they had uh, so many problems. Uh, and so these philosophies think of them, or for that reason religions, you know, think of them as solutions for the problems or the control is a little bit uh, tough word, strong word, but still these philosophies were in fact how to control people, how to control their you know, uh, problems, how to take care of the crimes and the chaos and the confusion that had set, you know, during the warring state uh, period. So think of philosophies as solutions, not as, you know, uh, solutions to the problems. Okay, so these uh, three major philosophies that we would talk about during, uh, you know, this session 16, Confucianism, Daoism, and Legalism. So I might have to uh, say one more time that uh, whatever religions that we have uh, right now, or whatever uh, philosophies that we have, think of these religions and uh, philosophical thoughts as uh, much more solutions uh, to the problems that we, you know, at one time or another time we get in ourselves into. Um, somebody might say, well, these religions and philosophies are the problems, you know, but that's not how they started we turned them into problems. They, they, they started as solutions to our problems. But then what do, you, what do you do when you turn a solution into a problem, you know, so that's, that's how that still goes on that problem. Somebody says, you know, I have this solution and I can fix your problem and say, no, that's another problem. You are giving us not a solution. So that would continue, you know, in history. Another thing about, since we're talking of Chinese civilization, and Chinese philosophies, keep in mind, uh, at the outset I can say that, that Chinese philosophy is very social and political, which means it's very secular. That means it is not based on any religion or uh, organized religion. Uh, it might have, you know, its own spirituality, uh, the Chinese people or Chinese civilization, but it did not have a strong religion like uh, Hinduism or Buddhism or Judaism or Christianity or Islam, a well entrenched re religion to base the philosophy on because some of these religions turn into philosophies. Chinese philosophies are very secular. They are not uh, the results of one sacred Old Testament or New Testament or the Quran or Shastra or one book or another book. They are the creation of the human mind. So that's why they are very rational. They're very practical and most of them social in their context, you know, rather than religious. And some of them are political. So we will talk about which one is much more social and which one is more political. However, uh, most scholars, they love to liken the Chinese philosophies with those, those of the Greek philosophies. And the Greek philosophies also, even the Greeks had, uh, you know, so many gods and deities and very rich religion, full of mythology and all that. But at the same time, Greek philosophy was also very rational. Uh, that, that is made, uh, you know, according to the human mind or by the human mind, not by a certain god or not certain commandments that went into the making of the Greek philosophy. So, for their philosophical mind and philosophies, the Greeks also did not conform to any particular religion. Although they had, as I said, religion or mythology, gods and deities, but they made their own secular uh, philosophies. When we say secular, it does not mean to be anti-religious or irreligious. It is just non-religious. So Chinese philosophy, like the Greeks, is very non-religious, not based on any religion. Okay, let's move on. 
and see uh, what we have in the birth of Chinese philosophy. Uh, this is uh, what's called the rise of the 100 schools. So many philosophical schools. These 100 schools are reference to is reference to the uh, you know different Chinese philosophies, various solutions, various schools that came you know sprang up uh, for different socio political problems that people wanted. So that makes the Chinese civilization very philosophical civilization. Even if you know Chinese somehow they're sometime you know like uh, in uh, stereotype referred to as a very pragmatic and very practical yes pragmatic and practical but they were also very philosophical when we say philosophy in united states or europe or the rest of the world the mind jumps to greek civilization yes the greeks were very philosophical but they were great warriors also they were great uh, sculptor also so greek civilization was not just only philosophy uh, similarly Chinese mind is very philosophical and Chinese civilization gave more philosophies, gave birth to more philosophical minds than the Greek did because Chinese were a big country, big population, you know, and for that reason bigger problems and bigger solutions for that. So keep that in mind that uh, Chinese civilization is very philosophical, very literate, uh, very educated compared to almost any civilization on planet earth. Chinese were very well educated people and hence so many you know, uh, philosophies or so many thinking or thoughts that went with it, with that civilization. Let's see further. Uh, these various solutions for different socio political problems. Uh, some social philosophies, there were social philosophies or social philosophical schools uh, which focused only on the society and the people and did not bother with the hereafter or with the religion or did not bother with the government or the state or the rule. So they were more, you know, geared towards the society, how to take care of the problems of the society of, or the people rather than, you know, the hereafter or the state or the government. Some were political philosophies that targeted only state and rulers and bureaucrats, you know, the officers, the officials of the state or the empire. So some would be in Chinese mind, some uh, China, uh, Chinese civilization, some would be social philosophies, other would be political philosophies or a mixture of both, you know, and some would be none of them. They would be for somebody, you know, only a limited number of people that you would see uh, in uh, China. Let's see the political circumstances that gave birth to so many or led to the birth of so many philosophical schools in China. Uh, Eastern job, uh, that uh, finally got into, uh, you know, a lot of production in the spring and autumn. Uh, you would see agriculture, commerce, and uh, what's called the agro-commercial development and great economic prosperity during the spring and autumn period of the Eastern Zhao uh, dynasty. So you have a lot of prosperity right there, a lot of peace, you know, and most of uh, you know the, the people those people who were skilled people craftsmen those who have who had a lot of time uh, on their hands they started creating these beautifully you know decorated uh, bronze and jade items uh, and as we noted previously most of the bronze and the jade items were for religious ceremonies or religious rites and so the product the production of the jade and the bronze uh, items led to the rise of sort of a commerce. Uh, this commerce was people needed these items because they could afford to buy them. And most of the uh, time, these items, jade and bronze item, as we noted last time, they had to be like uh, they, they were meant for uh, gifts to each other. So the, only the rich people, they could buy them, of course, and give it to their rich friends or to the king even, to the, the vassals, the landlords, you know, they would take them to please the king and have good relationship with the king or with among themselves. So that's how the rise of the bronze and the jade, you know, items and the commerce that it started. So this would be like very expensive stuff, but now it's becoming more and more available to more and more people, um, you know, in China. And then that will be definitely exported to different parts of the world. And that's how, as I said, you know, China would become known for the production of uh, jade, bronze, and especially, you know, porcelain and silk that it would become known throughout the world. Let's see further. So this is the time of peace and prosperity. However, during the same time, 
uh, what happened was these feudal states under different rulers called the dukes or the first nobles, uh, as we talked about them, you know, last time, these state rulers, the dukes or the uh, first nobles, they became stronger and stronger because the economy in their lands and their, you know, uh, areas or regions was doing so good, but they became stronger at the cost of the kings, the Eastern Zhou kings, uh, which is not good you know, uh, or at least it was not good for the king. The king could not control them. And pretty soon, you know, these uh, different states, they started sort of a struggle for supremacy among themselves. So these states created hostilities, uh, you know, in, the, in China. And it, it was not just only a struggle for supremacy among these rival states, it was also sort of a struggle for survival you know, against each other. And you would see it pretty soon. They would engage in this warfare. And that's why it's called, you know, the warring state uh, period to begin with. And during this war, uh, warring state uh, period, uh, they would wipe out each other or weaken each other at least and exhaust each other. And later on, one dynasty that was living out there in the West would come and, you know, take care of all of them. Or, I mean, uh, they would uh, just absorb all of these uh, states into one big empire, and that we would see later on in another session. Let's see further. Uh, so the struggle for supremacy and uh, for, uh, you know, survival that continued in the uh, states, rival states, uh, this, uh, this created what's called the sta ra warring state period that stretch from about 480 BC to 221 BC, and some people say 475, there is, you know, five years period, that's not a big deal. So this warring period, warring states period was very violent uh, because there was so many wars against, uh, you know, among so many states that there were, uh, as I said, some of them struggling for survival and some of them just, uh, you know, struggling against Egypt to sup supremacy these stronger states, the one that was strong, they conquered their neighboring weaker states. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, killing, a lot of warfare uh, that definitely disrupted the socioeconomic progress in the country. So during this war, the warring state period, uh, also you should note that the two things were going on, you know, and maybe contradictory. There was a lot of uh, peace, I mean, a lot of production, uh, a lot of progress, but at the same time, a lot of uh, socioeconomic disruption. And you might say, how that could possibly? Well, that's possible because some of them would be engaged in, you know, would stay peaceful, and some of them would be fighting among themselves. So that would give the contrast during the same period. The not only the socioeconomic disruption was, you know, the result of all these uh, fighting among the states, but also the social order, the old social order was collapsing. And so the Zhao peace was uh, being broken into pieces. And the old social order, order that the Zhao had, you know, uh, created in China, that was collapsing. And nothing new was coming into being. So the old order was being broken, but nothing was there to replace it. And that uh, made the warring state period to the end of it to 220 BC a period made it much more, you know, problematic. Okay, these are the warring states, uh, you know, if I could point them from Yen in the northeast, you know, coming to Hu to the southwest and there is the Lu one. And here is the Qin that would later on, you know, first it would let all these people to fight among themselves, all these states to weaken and exhaust themselves. And then the Qin would come and make alliances one one to get rid of these two or then to come after their own old allies, you know. So that's how the Qin would bring entire China under their control close to about 221 uh, BC. So this uh, warfare uh, you would see it much more going beyond uh, the warring state period. It would continue until and until, un unless somebody would rise, like the, uh, the Qin dynasty that we would see, and uh, bring everybody under their military and political control and impose peace upon them. Uh, this, unless that would happen, 
a strong personality, a strong dynasty that could bring everybody under their military and political control and impose peace upon them, you would see a lot of fighting in China. And that would be not just only China, we, we have seen that you know, in India and other civilizations also, in the absence of a strong center, in the absence of a strong government in one place, uh, you would see different petty kingdom or small states rising up, springing up, and then fighting among themselves, and then exhausting themselves, and finally someone, you know, would come to the forefront and finish them all, and bring all people and all the places in China under one strong control. And that was also referred to again and again in Chinese history as the unification of China. And later on, it would be the duty of almost every dynasty and every emperor to keep China united from now onward, from 221 onward, you would see that the, the unification of China, a major theme in the history and civilization of China. Let's see further in the political circumstances. Uh, some of these rulers, they need it, you know, uh, they, they need to survive. And so these rulers need for survival, uh, they needed skilled people skilled soldiers and strategic thinkers. Well, of course, anybody who is pitched against another state, they would need a lot of army, and not just only a lot of army, but great thinkers. And this is the time period that you see the rise of a person, Sun Tzu. And he wrote this book, The Art of War. Uh, this is an amazing book, you know, it's a small book but full of memorable, you know, uh, pieces of advices that Sun Tzu would give to any, you know, ruler. And believe it or not, this book is still used in certain academies in the United States, military academies, military schools in the United States, in Europe and the rest of, uh, you know, the world in Asia. And this, you know, it was written centuries before the birth of Christ, but this was a real great strategic mind person who studied uh, human psychology, who studied war psychology, who studied the terrain. Uh, there's so many things that he talks about, even you know, taking care of nature, uh, when to fight and when, when not to fight. And uh, some, some of these uh, great memorable pieces that he has, you know, uh, think about uh, winning but not fighting. You know, conquering a place without fighting, think of so, all these great strategies that he had, and he was not the only one, but he became much more known because he wrote it down, you know, put everything together. There were other people engaged by other states, other rulers to, you know, uh, help them to win the war against their rival states. So Sun Tzu, uh, if you have time, please, uh, you know, read and you would enjoy the reading of the art of war. Let's see further. So the, these rulers not only needed uh, military guys, they also needed political people. And, and the political people, uh, able advisors, political advisors that would, you know, and diplomats that would teach them uh, how to live, how to survive against all odds. Uh, one of them was Confucius, you know, who wrote this book, Analects. And some people say, you know, he did not write it. And I believe he did not write it, his students wrote it. So I'm just giving you these two examples of uh, Sun Tzu who wrote The Art of War and Confucius whose students wrote his, uh, you know, whatever he told them in the what's called the Analects. So here you see the two great persons, one political advisor and the other military advisor. All right, uh, Chinese classics, but these were not the only two books, there were several others that different people wrote for different purposes. And so while this was a time of trouble, you know, warfare and warring states period, but this period also produced classics, you know, they're called, they're called Chinese classic, great books, book of poetry, the book of changes, some of them just pure literature, some of them focusing on the society, the changes in the so society and the politics that uh, were there. This one, book of documents, book of history, what dynasty did what, which king did what, you know, things like that. Uh, chronicles, the spring and autumn annals that was produced in the Eastern Zhou dynasty uh, period. Uh, the book of rites, 
you know, the rituals, how to do, perform rites and rituals in the exact way. And then the, the Analects of Confucius, they're also added to these uh, greater Chinese classics. So five to six great books that uh, came into being during this period uh, make, or, you know, the Chinese classics. Now every civilization, just like the Greek civilization for that reason, or the Indian civilization, Every civilization, you know, produces its own masterpieces, uh, known for beauty, known for language, known for, you know, the art, uh, the literature. Uh, in ancient time, every time, you know, every period has its own literature. No question about that. In different fields, in politics, in society, in religion, spirituality, you know, in ethics and uh, aesthetics, uh, sculpture, you know. Uh, but here, the, the, this was the greatest period, although it was a period of, as I said, the time, time of troubles, but at the same time it produced wonderful uh, literature uh, that related to different fields, society, religion, you know, politics, just sheer, you know, aesthetics. So, Analex was, uh, it's considered one of them that, that is ascribed to uh, great master Confucius. Let's see further. Uh, Confucianism. Uh, Kung Tzu, or Kung the master or the teacher. Uh, Kung the master or the teacher, uh, he, uh, that name is uh, Latinized in Europe as Confucius. So to most American Conf uh, European, he would be known as uh, Confucius, uh, who lived, you know, around uh, 500 BC. Uh, 551 to 479 BC, and uh, you might remember from the previous lectures that he was the contemporary of uh, Buddha. You know, so while the Confucius was teaching in China, Buddha was teaching in India, and Mahavira was also teaching in India. And at the same time, while you know Confucius was teaching in India, uh, Socrates, you know, he was teaching in uh, in Greece. So that, that was a great chance coincidence for all these great people to be born at almost the same time. Uh, Confucius, he was the son of a minor officer or official in the state of Lu. Lu is a little bit down further south, uh, you know, that I did not show you on the map. Uh, so uh, he was the son of a minor official in the state of Lu. Uh, he did not come from a very big family or very powerful family, but middle, you know, uh, middle class family, however, uh, very early on, in his age, he had a problem, and that problem was that uh, he was just hardly born. You know, that uh, when his father just, he somehow, uh, people don't know what happened to him, like maybe he became sick and tired of the circumstances that he was living in, or the state that he was serving, uh, he just left everything. He left uh, his position, uh, he left his family, his wife, pregnant or just soon, you know, to be the mother. Uh, he left his family and his uh, office and disappeared. But when, uh, you know, Confucius, Kung Tzu, uh, he was growing and, you know, as a young man, uh, other kids in the street or in the neighborhood used to, you know, tease him, where is your father, you know, who is your father, things like that. And that civilization, you know, and some civilization is just too much not to have a father. And so he, he, he said, okay, one day I would go and search for him and I'll bring him. So one day he did go after him and he went for too long and too far away from home. So he searched for his father, asking people, you know, uh, it, it was a you know, long time ago that his father had left, but he nonetheless, he tried his best to search. Now it was during this search for his father that he came in contact with different people in different places that he went to and talked to them. That's how Buddha did, you know, he went for the search of truth in his own journey. He came, you know, in contact with great minds, great teachers, great sages of the time, wise people, and he learned from them. So was Confucius, he learned from a lot of people. However, he came back, you know, without his father, he couldn't find him. He didn't know where he went. Uh, so he came back uh, and he started his own teaching. That's how his, uh, you know, early life was. 
he had this problem of not having a father, but then he became like a, a father to so many other students that they would look to and would learn from. That's uh, you know a little bit uh, of the early life of uh, Confucius. He taught uh, history uh, and morality basically when he came back because he had learned so many things in so many places. And so he came back and he started his own school. Uh, he became a teacher and he, ha he had gathered by this time a large you know, uh, body of students and these students were his loyal followers wherever he would go, you know, uh, they would go with him because when he came back home, he didn't want to stay home. He wanted to go in search of a king that would practice his principles that he had learned. And so all these students, you know, those who could, of course, they would follow him from place to place and where he would go, there he would create his own, you know, body of students. And now these students later on would write these analects, the great classics, you know, of Confucius. Uh, he did not write them. They would write after him, uh, you know, when he was dead and gone. Uh, and th th these analects are based on the teaching of Confucius. So whatever he told them, they, you know, memorized them, they wrote them, and then finally they came together and put them together in a book later on to be called the Analects. This is not only just with Confucius. There's so many great people throughout history, uh, like Buddha. Buddha did not write anything, you know. His followers later on would write what Buddha had said. And so this is how Confucius, you know, uh, students, they would write what he had taught them. This is 500 years before the birth of Christ. This would be something also uh, with Christ that he would not write anything himself, but later on his followers, uh, the disciples that were with him, they had seen him, they had walked with him, they had stayed with him for quite some time, understood him, so whatever he said, you know, they would uh, write about him. That's how happened to a lot of great people in history. Some of these writings survived, some of them did not. So it depends on the circumstances in which they were written and they were preserved. Some preserved, some were not preserved. Let's see further. Uh, Confucius, you know, born, as I said, you know, 551 BC, uh, close to that period. Uh, he loved the Western Zhou kings and he used them as great models. He revered the Zhou dynasty, especially the early Zhou dynasty, that is the Western Zhou dynasty. And he believed that the kings of the Western Zhou dynasty, they were the true sons of heaven. They were great sages, sages. they were great moral kings. And they themselves were great, uh, you know, king philosophers because they lived and ruled in wisdom. And they, 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 they you know, they made China or their people peaceful and prosperous. So that's why he always used the Western Zhao kings as great models and he wanted other people to follow their, you know, example. He, as I said, he wandered, you know, a lot in search of a ruler who would put, you know, his uh, principle into practice or he, they would practice his principles, but unfortunately he couldn't find one and so he came, you know, home broken heart and started resuming his teaching, you know, and having his own students in school. Uh, also for him, good government was based on the mandate of heaven. So he did believe in the mandate of heaven. Uh, some people, you know, think that he created it. No, he did not create the mandate of heaven. It pre-existed during the Zhou dynasty and even before the Zhou dynasty, the Shang people talked about it. But now, mandate of heaven was becoming much more a political philosophy, especially under Confucianism. Now, as I said, he failed to find a good ruler, so he came back home, broken heart, of course, and he said, forget it, I will just teach my students and hopefully one of them would become a good king and would use, you know, his uh, principles. Okay, uh, with Confucianism, so what is the essence of Confucianism? Uh, in Confucianism, politics are based on morality and humaneness, not on militarism as so many rulers at that time, especially in the warring state uh, period, so many rulers, so many of these uh, first nobles are dukes, they were so militaristic. So with Confucian, Con Confucius would tell them, you know, 
that uh, politics or rule is not to wipe out other people or take their kingdoms. Uh, politics is to how to preserve peace, how to have good prosperity, how to take care of the people, uh, how to become a good human being. You know, that, that is politics, not how to wipe out people or kill people and take their homes, take their land, take their states. So he wanted the rulers, if he could or if they listened to him, he wanted them to move away from this killing and massacring and militarism and come home and focus on your own people and create good life for them, create a good state. So with him, the good state was the one, the good rule, good government was the one that would take care of the people, not, you know, wiping out other nations or other people. So that was, that's how he wanted to put morality and humaneness in politics and take militarism out of it. Let's see further. Also, in Confucianism, a king had to be or should have should be a virtuous role model. He should be not only himself a very good person, but he should be a role model for other people to follow. And he should inculcate, uh, spread virtuous conduct and virtue and you know morality in the kingdom. That's that's what his duty was. And he should preserve the best old traditions. Of course, with Confucius, the best old, you know, traditions were of the Zhou dynasty. And some people, you know, criticize him for that. He, he was just a traditionalist person, didn't want anything to change. No, he wanted to change people from bad to become good. So that if there was going to be any change, it should be for the better. That's what he believed. And he saw in history, uh, the good old times of the Zhou dynasty, so he wanted people to go back, you know, to the good old times and learn from the Zhou dynasty. Also, he wanted the king not just to rule, but be like a father of his people and take care of the people. Well, this is, you know, a new philosophy. Where it's, uh, you know, everybody should be doing it, of course, but nobody was ready you know, to be like the father, everybody, every ruler, you know, they, they, they were so much militaristic and thinking in terms of, you know, warfare and taking taxes from people, you know, filling the coffers of a state, uh, having a big treasury, good time, you know, drinking and all that stuff, uh, rule, you know, that's what they were rulers and interested in it. But he wanted them to know, yes, you are ruling, but rule in good, rule good and be a good ruler through morality, through taking care of the people. And again, again, that message you see in Confucianism, and that's no wonder nobody, you know, wanted to take his philosophy, nobody wanted, you know, to go by his principles because he wanted, you know, people to turn around, change their lives, and not only change their own lives as ruler, but change the lives of the people and teach them good morality and be good. Let's see further. Uh, in Confucianism, it's a sort of criticism, but I'm going to, you know, leave it to you. If it, you like it, you know, take it. If not, then leave it. But that's an individual responsibility and individual choices are. Uh, Confucianism, some people call it, it does not have any rights. People don't have any rights. They do not have any dues, but you have a lot of responsibility and a lot of duties. Yes, that is Confucianism. Confucianism is primarily the philosophy of responsibilities and duties. And he would tell you very openly, you know, anybody who would ask for his or her rights, he would say, you know, have you fulfilled your responsibilities that now you are talking about your rights? So he would much more focus first on a person's responsibility before that person opens his or her mouth to demand his or her rights. So that's how he wanted people to become uh, responsible people, you know. So Confucianism is not so much the philosophy of rights and dues, but the philosophy of responsibility and duties. Uh, it's also some people believe that Confucianism is the philosophy of giving to people rather than taking from the people. When you demand your dues and rights, of course you are taking something from someone, either from your family or the state or you know the society, 
But when you give to your family, you give to your society, and you give to your state, then you are the greatest Confucius, you know, and the greatest moral person according to Confucianism. So that's why Confucianism is much more the philosophy of giving to other people rather than taking from other people. So in Confucianism, you always stay above the people. And there you, you know, you're not, don't, don't look down upon the people, but you take care of the people. You want to, you know, do good to the people. And that's how the more you take care of the people, the more you gain respect and reverence and, you know, in uh, status in Confucius society. Let's see further. Uh, and the more you are in higher authority, the more you know, your responsibilities, the higher your responsibility towards those people who are lower in authority. This would be something that uh, most Confucian scholars or Confucianists these days, they explain it, that uh, again, you have to go back to the old philosophy of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, earth and heaven, the Chinese philosophy, and you are in the middle. So wherever you are, you have responsibility to and duty to fulfill towards those people who are below you. You know, so you are a father or mother parent. Uh, that's the highest uh, stage in the uh, family. Since you hold that higher stage in the family to be parent, then that higher stage comes with higher responsibility. That higher authority comes with higher responsibility and that your responsibility is to take care of your children. Give them good education. Give them good morality. You know, teach them this is your responsibility. If you leave them like that and you demand to be the father or the mother or the parent, you know, in the family, yes, that you are because, you know, you, you made these children, but now the responsibility is to teach them uh, good education, give them good education, good morality, you know, take them to higher ground, don't leave them somewhere down there, you know. So that's how your responsibility is. Wherever you are, whether, whatever you office you are, whatever position you might have, uh, this is modern day sort of a Confucianism, whether you are a, you know, president or prime minister, you are in that high stage and that's why your responsibility is higher. And that's the reason in Con Confucianism very strong and sort of a blaming and punishing people, especially those who are in higher positions. So the higher the position, the bigger or the greater or more dangerous their mistakes and blunder. And that's why greater blame and greater punishment for that type of a higher authority or person. Let's see further. Uh, filial duty, very big theme in Confucianism. Uh, that is the children's duty towards their parents. But it's not just only children's duty, also the parents' duty towards their children. So filial duty coming from family and, uh, you know, children. Uh, of seniors and junior people in the same family towards each other or in the same society. And also Confucianism is a philosophy of sacrifices and loyalty. You make sacrifices for your children and of course your children would be loyal to you or wherever, whether you are in family, in the state or in the society, that's exactly the more you, you know, fulfill your responsibility, make sacrifices for other people, the more they would be good and loyal to you. Uh, let's see further. Uh, here in Confucianism, you have these uh, what's called the uh, five cardinal relationships or the great three basic circles that Confucianism works. And all these three circles are very much tied to one another. Let's see first. This is the first and fundamental circle or unit of human development in Confucianism is that Confucianism is that of the family. So in Confucianism, family is the most important unit. If something is wrong with this family, everything would be wrong everywhere. But if you keep the family strong in good condition, the society would be better and you would have a better state and country. So after the family, the next important section or unit of human development is the society, your neighborhood, you know, that's more important. And so, just like the family works internally on good principle, so should be the society. And then the higher circle is that of the state. So all these three, they conform to each other and they work with each other. So the state and the society should be based on the principles of the family where the parents in the family take care of the children. 
in the society, the rich and the older people, they take care of, you know, the poor people or the younger people in the state, the king or the ruler, you know, or the political party that is in power take care of the people. So these three uh, basic circles, and think about yourself, you know, you, we all are in one or another circle. You know, we are born somewhere in a family, we live in some society, and work, we work in a state or country. All right, let's see these relationships. Uh, five great relationships that uh, work in family, society, and state. The father and son relationship, uh, the ruler and subject relationship, the husband and wife relationship that he talks about, very important relationship, the elder brother and the younger brother, and the rich and the poor friend in the society. So these ones, some of them family, some so father and son, uh, family, ruler and subject, society, husband, wife, younger and older brother, all in the family, and rich and poor friend, all in the society. So, uh, what happens in these relationships is that uh, the relationship between father and son. Father is responsible for the behavior of the son, for the education, for the raising of the son. He is responsible. So naturally, if something goes wrong with the son, and in the neighborhood or in the society, you know, they say, look, that son, I mean, he is the son of that and that, you know, so and so. Uh, the references always to the father. So if something is wrong with the son, that means the father really did not spend his time on the education, on the morality, on the raising and the development of this son. Exactly the same way now modern day Confucianists believe that if something is wrong with the daughter, the blame goes to the mother. She did not take you know, care of her, she did not teach her. Her daughter, that's why, you know, we see so many problems. Similarly, if there is a younger brother and he's not behaving right, so they would hold responsible the older brother, you know, that the older brother is not a real good role model for the younger one. So in this Confucian relationships, uh, in these relationships, we learn from each other as we take care of each other. That's how it works. So if something is wrong with the state, you know, their economic or political chaos and, you know, problems, then of course the person to be blamed would be the ruler, you know, would be the prime minister or the president or the political party that is ruling Democrat or Republican or whoever, you know, I'm just giving you an American experience uh, example. So it could be the mistake of the person who is in the White House or wherever he or she is, you know, plunged the country in one war or another war or, you know, made mistakes. Uh, created all this, you know, mess, and so that's how in Confucianism, because the head of the state, the head of the family, did not think wisely, that is why everybody in the family and in the state is in trouble. Similarly, in the society also, uh, if the rich people in the society, Confucian, uh, Confucius, he wanted the society to be based on nothing but a relationship between rich friends and poor friends, the older people in the society and the younger people in the society in which uh, some people would learn or would benefit from the wealth and the wisdom of other people in the society. So if there are rich people, they should take care of and help the not so fortunate people. If there are older generation people, they should share their wisdom with the younger people. And that is how they would fulfill their responsibilities and it is the duty, the filial duty of the poor and the younger people in the society to respect and revere the older and the rich people in the society because they help people, because they give so much, you know, to other people. And honestly, this is now just, you know, uh, like anybody else, it was very fashionable, you know, even with me to bash Bill Gates. But look, you know, he, he, yes, he's rich, but you cannot hate him just because he's rich. You, you should respect him, I would say. And I tell my students because he gives so much, and not only this country, but also in Asia and Africa. I mean, he is the first person to be giving so much to so many people. We may not know about it, but that's, you know, uh, what, what it is. So to give more and to more people, that is the greatest thing 
in Confucianism. Whether you are doing it at home, in your neighborhood, or in the state, or the country, or in the wider world. Okay, let's move on from this. Uh, Confucianism, uh, it has its own concept of nobility. So Confucian uh, nobility, a noble person, he or she is not born but made. Okay, so nobility with Confucian, Confucius is not by birth, but it is through uh, education. Uh, he believed that every person or human beings at large, human beings are good by nature, but the state or the family responsibility is to inculcate or develop that virtuous nature wherever, I mean, in their children or in the society. So you have to inculcate that virtuous nature through moral education, through humaneness, through politeness, through proper etiquettes. That is how we learn and how we become noble, not because we have a lot of wealth or a lot of land. So this is the big difference between Confucius meritocracy. That is the rule of the good people, the educated people, the meritorious people, but not the rule of the aristocracy that it was so much in Europe in medieval times. Aristocracy is that group of people called the nobility because they have a lot of land, a lot of power that came from the land or with the land or on the basis of the land, a lot of wealth. So the wealthy and the landlords, they went into you know, big bureaucratic positions that would run the state. But in Confucianism, these people were not good. For in Confucianism, the good people were the virtuous people who were educated people, who were polite, who were humane people, who were moral people, and so they went and, you know, into what is called the meritocracy that reigned uh, China. Okay, so in meritocracy, this would be the rule of the learned scholars, uh, not of the landlords of the, or the rich people that we see so much in so many countries. So if we go by Confucianism, there would be less chance for corruption and more, you know, good things would be coming out of the state or the government. So, you know, in a lot of places, Confucianism is still, uh, you know, uh, strong in the families, in the society, those who practice it. Uh, Confucianism is still valid for people. But there are, you know, other philosophies, rival philosophies or anti-Confucian philosophies that people don't like him for one reason or another reason don't like that philosophies. Let's see further. Uh, Confucianism was the most influential socio-political philosophy, not only just in China, but also in East Asia. Now, in China, Japan, and Korea, and other societies that conform to Confucianist philosophy, they would be always very strong on the family, very strong on education, and very strong on morality and etiquettes. That is what Confucianism, you know, teaches people. And so entire East Asia is very Confucian culture, whether some people recognize it or not. Okay. That's why because, he, you know, a lot of people revered him, they loved him, and they made these temple and shrines, not only in China, but also in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I went to, you know, in China, uh, when, when I was there in Shanghai, I went to a Confucius, uh, you know, temple. And there were so many people, you know, coming and going, coming and going. And all these people, they just wanted to pay homage to him, just to pay their respect to him, what a great person he was, you know, because uh, he taught them to care for their families, to care for themselves. They, he taught them good morality, good etiquettes. You know, it's not a religion. Uh, it's a social philosophy. And that's why it was so popular with so many people, although, you know, so many rulers or kings rejected it. Let's see further. Uh, why so many rulers rejected Confucianism? Well, because it demanded too much. You know, they, they, the rulers believed that it demanded too much and too much insistence on this responsibility and morality. And these rulers, they wanted to enjoy life, you know, not to fulfill any responsibility. So that's why they rejected Confucianism. Uh, Confucianism also generated rival philosophies against itself. 
like Darwinism and legalism, these were also, you know, sort of uh, anti-Confucian philosophies that we will later on talk about. Uh, this uh, uh, poster, uh, this picture of a poster, this is in 1970s in China, uh, during what is called the Cultural Revolution, uh, which is very, you know, modern times, 1970s. Uh, these people believed, uh, these were young Chinese communists that killed old Chinese communist and non-communist people in China. And some of these believe that uh, China is still living in Confucianism or some people were living in according to Confucianism and traditionalism and so they went after them and killed them. Uh, so that's why I wanted to bring this uh, modern, you know, poster or picture to show you that people rising up against Confucian philosophy and Confucian uh, traditionalist. Uh, because some people believed that if you go back, you know, to 500 years before Christ, that is not good. You are taking people back into history and not into forward into future. So these uh, young Chinese communists, they were thinking too much of progress and, you know, uh, future. And so they believed that it was not good to go back go forward, go move forward, maybe, I don't know, you know, you think for yourself, if we leave, you know, the old people, the old culture, the old civilization, the old religions, you know, Moses, Christ, Muhammad, or whoever, you know, and you say, you know, all this is uh, nothing, and just let's move forward, you know, out of all these great traditions and religions and philosophies and morality, I don't know where the world would be, and no wonder, you know, these people, in the name of progress, in the name of moving forward to the future, killed millions of their own Chinese, you know, uh, just because they did not agree with their type of, a, you know, futuristic, uh, very violent views, uh, communist views. So that's what happened and that's why I wanted to bring this uh, picture. And so just to, uh, you know, remind you that uh, Confucianism, it generated rival philosophies, especially Dovism and Legalism, and let's see what those philosophies were. Dovism, uh, Lao Tzu, <laughs> Uh, he was a great philosopher. Uh, some people believe that he really did not exist, but people made, you know, his existence. Because, and this philosophy already existed, but they needed a founder, you know, to put his name. And so there is, you know, Lao Tzu, 6th, 4th century BC person. Uh, found, and so they, they parade him as a founder of uh, Daoism, a legendary type of a person uh, whose existence is always questioned, who did not exist, some people believe. But anyway, uh, and some of these uh, Davis, they believe now he, he was a real person. He met even Confucius and wanted to talk Confucius out of his Confucianism, but failed. And some believe that Confucius learned a great deal from, you know, uh, Lao Tzu, the founding father of this Davism. So let's see what is this Dao. The Dao uh, spelled with T, you know, and now more people write it, spell it with D. So T is also pronounced as D. So Dao, uh, that means the way. Uh, and most people believe this is the way of nature. And Dao Di Jing uh, by Lao Tzu, th these are the Chinese characters, and this is the, the, you know, Lao Tzu, the founding father of this philosophy, Daoism, and he's uh, riding on this uh, water buffalo. Uh, this is the time he's facing west, going west uh, to the desert because uh, he wanted just to live in the countryside or in the nature. But somebody told him, before you disappear in the desert, would you please write your book? You know, and so that's how he, you know, uh, stayed behind to write his book, uh, Dao Di Jing, and people now benefit from it. Uh, it's, some people believe it's, a, you know, much more a book or a philosophy of uh, sort of uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, confused thoughts or spiritualism at best, or supernaturalism. But if you look at closer, a lot of people, they say, no, this is, at best, you can call it naturalism or the rule of nature. Uh, he believed that let nature take its course. Don't change anything, you know. And uh, because he thought the solution is that why we are suffering so much, because he believed that we are suffering because we are living in society which is full of more materialism and full of problems, so the easiest way to get rid of all these problems is for you to get out of them and go and live in the countryside, in the nature, which could be a forest, which could be a wood, 
you know, forest or uh, jungle or the countryside and live there in the beauty, the innocence, the purity, the serenity of nature. He believed that nature had its own healing powers. If you live in nature, it would heal you and it would cure all your ills, all your problems. So he wanted to take people out of materialism and put them into the spirituality of nature. So that's what he told people, leave materialism for natural so, uh, spiritualism. That's what he believed in. And because of Daoism, you should know that there is much more respect for nature in, among the Daoist people. Uh, also, some people characterize Daoism as the philosophy of non-action or pacifism. Uh, he wanted people not to go to extremes, you know, stay in the middle ground. And that's how later on the yin and yang uh, uh, emblem would be, you know, much more associated with Daoism. Uh, so he wanted people to, you know, don't take any action. If somebody, if a ruler would come to him and would ask him, you know, what is the best law that I should have in my kingdom? He would say the best law is not to have any laws. Because the more you have these laws, the more people break them. And, you know, then you punish them. And so why to have these laws? Uh, they, they don't help anyway. So not to keep these laws, not to, that's the, and if somebody came to him, how to be a good ruler, how to rule? He would say the best way to rule is not to rule at all. You know, why you have to be ruling somebody. So he had all these negative type of, uh, you know, things for people to tell, give them this advice. You know, what is the best to do this? He would say the best way is to do nothing about it. Just leave it and go away, move away out of it, you know. So that's how people, he told people, get out of, you know, you know a present living mode or circumstances and change it to something else and go to nature and live there in beauty and the purity and the serenity and, you know, the innocence of nature and you would get this innocence and you would be cured of all these uh, toxic thinking and toxic head and heart that we have so much problems. This was, you know, Darwinism. Let's see further. Uh, Darwinism was also against education you know, especially Confucian education because it created so many class differences, uh, which I don't believe it does, but they believe that so many people because of education had grabbed so many powerful positions, so it created class differences. Uh, Confucian scholars, once they retired, you know, they retired into Daoism sort of, you know, they turned to Daoism and after retirement, because although Davis, they did not Confucian people, but Confucian they, scholars, they loved Davism because they wanted peace, you know, of mind and body that Davism provided. Uh, Davism also helped Buddhism spread in China because a lot of Chinese believed that Buddhism was a branch of Davism. So that's how, you know, uh, Davism unwittingly helped uh, Buddhism. Now, who could be a Daoist? That question is, you know, could everybody afford to be a Daoist? Not really. Uh, it wanted people to leave the material society. Well, think, think about it. How many can do that? Leave your family, leave your everything, your car or whatever, you know, your home and go and live like a hermit in the forest. Well, there were a lot of people who could do it. And so that's how Daoism was not for everybody, but anybody who could do it, they would, you know, and they adopted it. Daoism was also for those people, especially the Confucian people, who had lived their, all their lives in an office full of responsibilities and duties, and now they wanted peace, you know, and so they would become Daoist. So Daoist was for everybody and for nobody at the same time. If you could do it, you would go into it you know, or if you didn't like it, you come back, you know, to your old ways. Let's see further after Daoism. In China, the rise of what is called legalism. Now, legalism, uh, it started very early on, but later on you get these two great uh, uh, proponents or legalist, you know, Han Feizi, 3rd century BC, and Lu Su of uh, about, he died 208 BC. Uh, both, in fact, related to the Qing dynasty. I'm sorry, the Qin dynasty in China. That's how China is known after the Qin, C-H-I-N or Q-I-N. Uh, legalism, uh, what it was, it was a rule by the law, not 
a rule of law. And I would explain that what it means, but uh, note it down, legalism was the rule by law and not a rule of law. This, the, the rules were made by the state, by the ruler, by the government, for the people, but not by the people, you know. And so there was no say or no room for the people to have anything to do with this law. So people did not make, or their representatives did not make these laws. Uh, they, they were made for the people and people had to live by it. And these laws were not, you know, uh, good laws. They were very, you know, strange and strict laws. Basically, legalism was military and political dictatorship by the ruler or by the dynasty. So that's why when it comes to legalism, that, uh, so many people, they, 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 you know, take legalism as a dictatorship, military and political dictatorship by the king or by the dynasty, in which people don't have any say. You know, they would be just told, do this, and they would have to do it. If not, then you would see the consequences, let's see, that in legalism. The legalists, they believed that laws were the word of the rulers. That is by the order of the czar or by the order of the king. So whatever was the word or the whim of a ruler, that was the law of the land. So people did not make these laws. Uh, you know, they were made for the people by the rulers. So the idea was to control and chain people by these laws. And the, the legalists, they believed that human beings were evil by nature. And that's why you had to control them and chain them through different laws. They also believed that people were prone to dis disobey and revolt because in the, you know, recently in the warring state period that this philosophy came about, uh, there was, there were a lot of warfare, you know, there was a lot of disturbance, you know, chaos and confusion. And so revolts and disobedience, of course, so they, they believe that to take care of this dis disobedience and revolts of the people, you have to have these laws. Uh, as I said, they, they had, you know, the history or the evidence of the warring state period in front of them. Now, the main purpose of the law uh, was to force people in subjugation. And they had to back up these laws by severe punishments. They believed that people, why people obey the law? Because they have, they have the fear of severe punishments. Now, to the legalist, they not only believe the law, but they also believe in severe punishments, uh, very harsh punishments. Uh, some of them would say, you know, if you punish small crimes with severe punishments, big crimes would take care of themselves, which meant that if, if you punish people for small crimes very severely, then they would know, you know that there would be much more severe punishment for the bigger crime. So that's how they thought, you know, punish people severely for small crimes so they would not commit the big crimes. So this, this was not really to have a good state. This was meant to control people through the laws and severe punishments. They also believe that there should be okay some rewards because people are greedy. They want some reward. So there should be some reward uh, for the people, but not too many rewards. They did not like these rewards. Uh, also, Confucianism believed that this is the duty of the king to spread education, but the legalists believe that no, keep people illiterate. Why? They believe that it's easy to control illiterate and ignorant people. That's why if the philosophy is to control people or the state is to control people, then why you educate them, keep them illiterate and ignorant, and so you would be easy for you to control them. Uh, keep a big army, a strong army. Uh, why you need that? Well, the, the reason was if you have a big army, strong army, that meant uh, that, meant that uh, uh, you know, it would be a good deterrence for people. So uh, your enemies, internal and external enemies, they would think 10 times before they rise against you. So that's why you need to have this big, big army. Now, how you can have this big army? Well, draft everybody, which is called conscription. You should have a universal conscription throughout China. Grab as many young, able-bodied people 
and bring them into and recruit them by force, draft them into this army, and that's how you would have this army. Now, this army, it had to be self-financing army. These young men, the soldiers, they would grow their own food, they would have their own cattle, they would have their, you know, everything, even their weapons. They would make their own weapons that would protect them, so they better make better weapons for themselves because their life was dependent upon them. So that's how the self-financing, you know, philosophy came in. Now, this big army that uh, the Qin dynasty, especially the legalist dynasty, produced, this army, it did not fight much. And when it did, it fought very brutally because it's a very strong army. And that's why so many people internally and externally, they were so afraid of the Qin uh, army. Also, this army, when it was not fighting in peacetime, it would do construction work. So it was this big conscripted or drafted army of the Qin dynasty that it made the Great Wall of China. So to keep con in control the young men, you know, force them into labor, uh, slavish labor, and that's how, you know, this uh, dynasty uh, came up. Uh, it did not rule for long because it was a very harsh, very severe you know, rule, and so it did not rule for long, but it did, you know, a lot of great things. One of them is the, the making of this building of this Great Wall of China, or most of it, you know, the Qin Dynasty did with this conscripted or drafted army. Uh, also, this, uh, the draft was very severe. I mean, nobody could escape. There were these, uh, the people used to say that uh, even the dead people could not escape the draft, the Qin draft, because their names were written there, so they had to, you know, be brought back, that is how people would serve for their dead father, you know, or son or brother. Uh, you might have seen the story of Mulan when the recruiting gang, they come and serve these notices that you have to go and serve in the army. And the father of Mulan didn't have a son, so she, you know, became a son to serve in place of her father. So uh, this, this philosophy, legalism was for the rulers, for the state not for common people or for professors or philosophers, but this was for the rulers and the state how to rule. Uh, let's see in conclusion what we did today. Well, we did a lot, I think. Uh, we talked about the times of trouble during the warring state period, which led to the rise of philosophies and these different philosophies, Confucianism, Daoism, and legalism that we talked. And next time we will talk about the Qin dynasty. And thank you very much and aloha.